I found the process of managing a business really not natural. But some people, it doesn't matter what you do, you're just going to be stuck with a monster. We don't want to be doing this for free. We need to be making money. We're in business. You can be in a job and enjoy it, but not love it. You've got to know where you stand with your competitors. You've got to be transformable. If you've got that attitude, you really can achieve anything. This is Professional Builder Secrets, the number one podcast to help you grow your building company safely and securely. Brought to you by the Association of Professional Builders. Join us every week as we talk to industry experts and your fellow professional builders on everything you need to know to generate more leads, more sales, and higher margins while improving the building experience for your clients. Hello, and welcome to the Professional Builders Secrets podcast, a podcast by the Association of Professional Builders for building company owners, general managers, VPs, and emerging leaders. Here we discuss all things running a professional building company from sales processes, financials, operations, and marketing. We have another exciting episode from the Professional Builders Secrets podcast. I'm joined today by Phil Turner, Managing Director from Turner Trading in Tasmania. Phil, welcome. Thanks, mate. Good to be here. Yeah, nice to have you. I'm really excited to speak to someone from Tasmania. It's all my places to go. Phil, tell us a little bit about Turner Trading and what you specialize in and how did you get here? Right. Well, Turner Trading, first and foremost, we're a family business. So it's uh, myself as a director. I have my son, Aiden, who's on the tools, and my daughter's also back of house. So she does the office, keeps me in order and check. So yeah, that's where we're at there but I guess in terms of what we specialize in we're custom builders and because of my training it gives us a little opportunity in two areas firstly architectural and so that's we we do work predominantly with architects a lot of builders do work do architectural work but I was fortunate in my training where you know my boss at that time had us work with architects and alongside architects through the whole process of the job. So I was groomed, if you like, in that. So I don't see that as an unusual experience. Where so that gives us a little bit of an edge sometimes, depending on the project, and also heritage work. So there's not as there's a lot of opportunity here in Tassie with heritage work, but it's not like in Brizzy where I'm from. They just don't have the funding for it um, at that scale. So, yeah, so down here predominantly we're custom builders architectural. So that leads, I suppose, a little bit into where I came from, I suppose, how we got here. Yeah, so I was back in the day, I I was in college in New South Wales and there was an opportunity for a pre-vocational course up in Brizzy. And I had thought before that I'd probably be an engineer building bridges and things like that. But as things worked out, that didn't happen. So I saw this pre-vocational course and always had an interest, good with my hands, always had an interest, you know, in carpentry. So I did this course and there just were not a lot of jobs going in Brizzy. And this fella came to TAFE at the end of that course looking for apprentices, which was unusual at the time. And, yeah, I went and did some work for them and I was very lucky to get the job. Apparently uh, the other young fella that, applied for the job was was slightly better but they were just too scared to say no to me because I was that keen <laughs> that I wouldn't I was just hanging hanging around them like a bad smell so but yeah they they gave me the opportunity and they were boat builders traditionally that got into heritage work so right. it's very unusual but it just meant hands on you know those traditional skills so that's that's where I come from I guess in terms yeah. of training but I often bang on about your training and, and it being a representation of how you got to here or wherever you're at. Always giving kudos to that because I think that's lacking these days. Just to acknowledge that you didn't get here by accident, a lot of people have contributed to that. And, um, and in my case, that is so true. You know, I've been very lucky to get the training. So that's our commitment now is to train I think we're on to our 25th or 26th apprentice. Wow. Uh, we're only a small operation, so that's, you know, we've had a, a couple on the go all the time. 
And I just want to pass that training on and put some good chippies out there. Hmm. Yeah, it's a definitely a noble legacy to keep and sustain as well, especially at a time when there's a shortage of skilled trade workers out there as well. So it's interesting that you talk about leaving a legacy as well, which we will tap into because you've also talked about your family. And I want to talk to you about, you know, how you got your family involved into this. But for now, tell me a little bit about Let's take a trip back down memory lane. Tell me a little bit about your purpose. You know, do you consider yourself an accidental builder? Do you consider well, do you consider that this was the purpose that you walked into? Do you choose it? You know, tell me a little bit about how you made this your purpose today. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I I guess when I was really young, or as you I think everyone does this when they're young, they you know, what am I gonna be, you know, when I grow up? Building wasn't on my radar as the first first option, I suppose. I, I love cooking. I've always been passionate about that, but worked in a restaurant when I was young and that cured that very fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, you know, uh, the, you know, architecture in there, we're always interested in buildings, you know, and construction. But like I said, there, one stage engineering, I think that was a pipe dream really. But yeah, getting into, uh, no, I don't think building was ever something I envisaged and thought I would have as a career but we're talking very young anyway like I, I started my carpentry apprenticeship a little late like a lot of fellas starting their teens or late teens I was 20 21 when I started that the CNF 001 it was called it was a pre-vocational course in Brizzy so yeah I, I don't think I thought I would be yeah a carpenter or a builder as such but as for running a business, I can probably speak to that more. I come from a family that one way or another have always been in business, run their own businesses. So I guess that's in the blood. So when I did the carpentry course, I just absolutely loved the, the skill side of it, the carpentry. I fell in love with carpentry. I think it a wonderful trade and particularly, you know, I was very lucky again doing the heritage work it's not throw them up construction. It's very interesting. You're learning old rules and old old skills and in terms of symmetry, getting the balance right. So there's a lot of aesthetic involvement and ergonomic as well in the old ways and yeah, just really basic stuff and where it comes from, it's all in there and why we do things the way we do today and why we've moved on from those things. So, yeah, that's kind of... Does that answer your question? Yeah, that- yeah. I mean, it, it's fascinating because in a world where we're also losing so much of our heritage, it's amazing to find someone that's actually started and looking at taking those lessons and then, you know, enhancing it even more in the future. So there's a lot of there's a lot of perspectives that come with your craft of work as well. I'm just curious, you know, <clears throat> when you look back now, what were some of the most memorable mistakes that you made when you first got started? that you always remember and potentially, you know, defined your career in many ways, because, you know, many builders will have those classical entities that they'll remember, especially if it, if it's a mistake. Well, that's a really interesting question. I think I won't say outright my mistakes have defined me, but there are so many to list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You're in I'd safe like company, Phil. About, You're in safe I'd company. Like to, I'd like to talk about how I moved forward from those mistakes. But look, when you're young, you're new in business, you're dealing with all this money. I said I come from, you know, family of running businesses. I didn't necessarily define that as successful all the time. They certainly, my father and and others certainly had their challenges and battles. So that, you know, I found the process of managing a business really not natural. I guess it's the same for everyone in that sense, but some people do it easier than others. I'm not one of those people. There are things I do really well and there are things I don't do well. So in terms of mistakes, they're all, oh, (laughs) there's so many, but certainly time management was not a strong point. Certainly is on the tools because that's how you're, you're trained, you know, with systems and management. But as we all know, it's the management of the business that, is the motor, and that's where I really lacked a lot of skills. So a lot of mistakes were made there. Uh, time management, money management, people management, <laughs> clearly defined goals, you know. And there are 
key times where certain things happened, re- you know, we worked for some really difficult clients and there's a mistake right there. Because I think with on that subject, that, you know, you have the opportunity. Sometimes your gut tells you, you know, this, this is not a good option and just having the courage really to say no. So that's, yeah, it's a mistake in itself when you can't do that, you know. I was a bit of a yes man, I guess, in that sense. So learning to say no has been part of the journey, which is interesting because moving forward you think it's yes, don't you? But, but yeah, so lots of mistakes. But a key one where things really came ahead for us was we, you know, the old saying, too big, too quick, uh, there was a boom in southeast Queensland, in fact, most of Queensland at the time, back in 2000 on, really, from the introduction of GST right through to about 2008. It was just boom time. So, you know, at times there were, I think, some of the statements were 5,000 people. You know, it was either a week or a month moving to southeast Queensland from Victoria and, and Sydney. Yeah, so Melbourne and Sydney areas. And, you know, so work wasn't a problem. We had lots of work. So we expanded very rapidly. But without that skill set that I mentioned before, uh, we were doomed. And we had a business failure in 2000 and I think it was registered in 2019 and we went into voluntary administration. That's my greatest accumulation of mistakes to date. And you have a choice right there. You know, do you sulk? (laughs) <laughs> which I did for a week, <laughs> or do you, you get back up, dust yourself off, move forward and learn from it. So that really defines from that date, you know, 2009, because that, that sort of takes a fair while to go through that process and not pleasant. But, you know, we wanted to maintain a level of integrity, which is always difficult when you're in that situation. We wanted to pay people. So we sold up and paid people and then and moved down. Oh, we were actually travelling for a while and then moved down to Tassie and, and started all over again. We didn't think that's what we'd do. We thought we'd go back to Brizzy. I had a good base there still, a reasonable reputation given the circumstances, but because we, we, you know, we did our best to make sure we did the right thing there. Um, but, yeah, in the end, Tassie got us and uh, it's a wonderful place and it's been a, a great First of all, healing place for us and going through that experience and also moving forward and growing and learning new things and learning from that. So, right. yeah, that's the accumulation right there. Yeah. Well, I'm going to definitely dig a little deeper about the, you know, the transformation and the key struggles and how you changed it. But let's talk about difficult clients. You know, if you look back, what are some of those, you know, one, if you can think of one key difficult client and what did it teach you and how do you avoid, you know, for our listeners out there, how do you avoid getting more of those difficult clients? That's really, there's a bit to that. I think that in a nutshell, if you're marketing yourself correctly and you've got your feelers out there and they're, you're getting enough leads or people coming in, you're in a position where you can pick and choose. Firstly, if you're in that position where you can pick and choose, it helps with being able to discern better. Whereas if you're in a position where you really need work, you haven't perhaps planned well and made good use of the good times and got everything in order. And so if you're not exposed as much where you're in the way you want to be and you're not getting enough, like I said, leads or um, you know client base coming in and, and wanting work, then it's very difficult to pick and choose because you're dependent on the work. So that's probably first and foremost, and that's something I've learned from APB. And I'd really like to go into how they changed my thinking on marketing, if there's an opportunity to do that in this conversation. But but your gut, for me, historically, Nelly, I can tell you it'd have to be almost all the time. My gut told me, no, <laughs> this is not the right client for you there was just something you know and I ignored it and a big mistake for me that was consistent when I was young is I didn't listen to my wife my wife has not been in our business in terms of an operational sense but she's certainly always been aware and you know has my best interest at heart and nearly all (laughs) and nearly every account she'd say why are you doing that job you know why are you working for them and she was right so listening to your gut, 
listening to your wife or partner. And I think there's still true things, you know, there are things that you'll, you'll know. But doing your homework a little bit more on people, I in the business world you sort of think, oh, people have got to do their homework on you and you've got to convince them. It's a little bit the other way around too. You've got to make sure they're the right client for you. You've got to make sure they're the right client for your team. I don't want my kids exposed to a difficult person unnecessarily, you know. And some people can become difficult and that could be as much our, you know, something we've got to work on, effective communication, etc. But there can be a lot done to avoid that happening. But some people, doesn't matter what you do, you're just going to be stuck with a monster. <laughs> uh, well, actually, let's get into the APB conversation because I think there's there's a lot of curiosity here that I have. So what were some of the key struggles? Obviously, you talked about moving to Tasmania. I'm assuming that you started the APB mentoring program when you were in Tassie. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I only reasonably, I think we've only been going with the program less than 12 months oh, wow. so yeah yeah we've not been with them a long time but part of the reason why i agreed to this today this podcast is we have such noticeable improvements and look you've always got to take time to measure improvements so it is early days but i've been doing this long enough to know what i've been looking for in terms of change and these things are definitely happening and the checks and measures that are in place to make sure that they're happening um, are coming up with really positive results. And with this sort of thing, you always get, you know, I'd never trust an ad, you know, because, you know, you get people paid to respond. Um, this is, you know, my position's really genuine. And I've always offered to Dennis, my coach, or our coach rather, that I'd really like to talk about this stuff because it, it has made a tremendous difference to us here. I think I speak for the whole team and we're not a big team, but it, is, it has impacted everyone in a very positive way. Our more senior staff, if you like, uh, are commenting on the change in me and the, the confidence that I have and how I've let go. I'm delegating better. Um, I find that really interesting. Yeah, that's really fascinating to hear you yeah. say that as well. Uh, uh, tell me, okay, so let's, you know, let's take me through your mindset, right? So what were some of your challenges? You, you talked a little bit about marketing and financial. What were some of the things that have changed and transformed because of the mentoring program? Right, well, when I, I, I've actually noticed APB flagging for a while and, and different, you know, adverts and things, mainly on social media. Uh, I'm on that a bit. And sort of looked at it and went, oh, you know what, you know, is that the right choice for me? The reason I was looking was I've never really felt like I've hit the mark. You know, profitability's never been where I've wanted it to be. I've never been really, I, I think I've had a lot of knowledge across the industry, across running a business. So a lot of bits of information, if you like, but the... I didn't have the right connection or flow of that knowledge. So it wasn't all connected. It wasn't, it wasn't operating well. The motor wasn't working well. Right. And, and so I went, I, I need something. You know, I need to bite the bullet here. I've been doing this way too long to not have, I guess, parameters that I could recognise as successful. You know, this is working. Uh, this is the way I want it to operate. And that's right across the board. So first of all, I'll, I'll, you know, obviously financially hitting financial goals, making sure that we're, and being able to say, look, we are profitable. That's a big thing for me. I mean, the, I expect for most businesses, you know, that might be 101, you know, do trade, you know, be disciplined, get a good result. That has not been <laughs> how I would define my experience at all. Um, it's been really difficult. So from the get-go, so we decided to go with APB and from the get-go, they just, they really simplified a lot of things. So I think at times I've you know, looked at something and got all anxious about it because, you know, it's quite complex or it's quite, you know, there's a lot involved in it or it takes a lot of work. And given that I've been doing this career for a long time, this is going to take a lot more energy. Having APB... Dennis, again, is our mentor, having them in the background 
has just been a real encouragement to me um, in that I feel supported in the learning process. So it takes that difficulty out of the way. And yeah, for me, it's been encouraging having someone. So tell me about uh, your relationship with Dennis. Obviously, there's, there comes a hesitance when you try something new for the first time or you, you start a coaching program with someone. When was your, you know, when did it click that this is actually working for you? Early. Dennis was able to identify early what some of our issues have been. Here's a simple example. It was needed a clear picture of our figures. Where are we at? You know, what are we turning over? Size of our team. What are we turning over? And, you know, where are we really at? Where's our bottom line? But something in there that came up was he discussed, you know, what are our fixed costs, you know, our overheads and, you know, he talked about this figure of it being around, you know, con- fairly consistently in the industry around the, you know, 14, 15%. And, you know, we popped up there way above that. And he took a look at our figures and went, mate, you've got your, this is almost embarrassing, you know, you've got your uh, your staff, your tradies uh, coming into your coming into your fixed overheads. And I said, that can't be the case, you know. So once they were removed from that and put where they should be in part of the, you know, cost of doing business in the sense of the job and it's calculated in the job, we were operating at, at about that 14%. And I tell you that, and that, like that was just identifying something so simple that we were, that was a hangover from a bookkeeper we kept that just wasn't doing things correctly. I didn't pick up on it, just just missed it. and. Here it is, you know, we're actually not looking so bad. There's actually room to move there in terms of, you know, you can make all the money in the world, but if you're spending it all, you know, <laughs> and you're, you're too top heavy in that sense and you've got too many, you know, assets that you're tending to, you, you're going to, yeah, you're going to go under. But, you know, we just had something in the wrong spot. He spotted it straight away. He just looked at it and went, mate, <laughs> I can't be there. And uh, and I mean, it's rather obvious. That's why I say it's a little bit embarrassing, but you kind of got to take that on the chin because this is what they're good at. And right down straight away, you know, he said, you know, what's your turnover? What are you looking at there? And so we sort of clearly clarified some goals early. And this is a key thing. Some of the goals were focusing not just on turnover because it's not necessarily the secret to turn over more. But for us, we needed to turn over a certain figure and we set that goal that, you know, we, in, within 12 months we'd like to turn over this particular figure and also then getting a true representation on the go of how you're looking from a, you know, a profitability um, perspective. So we set a goal, we put wheels in motion um, and there was a lot of stuff happening in the background that Dennis was helping us with you know, working on the, the business or the organisational culture, you know, as well, and clearly defining roles, making sure it's a, what are our values, it's a positive workspace, you know, for people so that they they are able to do their job. So that is all happening in the background and within a very short space of time. I'm still taking a double take on these figures, but we're not just hitting that mark. We're well exceeding our expectations and our goals. So, Phil, tell me, how did the APB mentoring program really impact your business financially and and how did you transform the business? Yeah, well, Dennis was able to help us, first of all, get a basic understanding, break things down into simple components so that I understood what he was doing, just some of the language, you know, work in progress or whippers, you know. I I thought I had a grasp on that. I did not (laughs) at all. (laughs) And uh, he just sort of broke things down, first of all, and, and explained the general language and also specific language with finance and financial documents. So take me through the process. So Dennis, talked to you a little bit about the systems. How did you transform the business? Yeah, so initially it was we identified that we needed to look at a few things, appropriate growth or expansion. We were probably not turning over enough I say that with a lot of caution. Um, it wasn't like this um, massive expansion <laughs> approach because uh, we know all know where that can end up. But a strategic approach to just understanding that for those goals that we set, these financial goals, 
it meant that we'd need to be running a certain number of projects at a particular value. That's helped us in different ways. Also identify jobs that we would accept and not accept because, you know, we need that kind of value in there to turn over. So that was the first thing we, we, we started saying, well, look, doing one at a time, that's not going to meet it. You know, we need to put ourselves in a position with our current staff. We knew at the time we had another staff member coming on board, another carpenter. So we were able to just set a simple sort of goal, if you like, and realised that we needed to be more systematic with the, you know, our starts in our projects, with being more systematic and having a follow-on with our scheduling we were able to immediately turn over a certain value, I guess. That actually kicked in straight away and started occurring. It was actually really fluid. I thought that was going to be really difficult, but it was a lot more fluid than I expected. It just We just went straight into it. We obviously already had the work there in the background, but my usual approach of going, okay, well, I've, I mentioned before that I've had negative experiences with too big, too quick, so I've probably got a you know, a bit of a hangover from that and not wanting to, that we were nurtured. Dennis was great in saying, hey, look, this is this is okay. You kind of need to do this. And it, it, the results, you can't have immediate results, but, you know, let's say the first quarter when we did reviews, we were reviewing all the way along, so it wasn't like we were guessing. But when it came in and, you know, we, we kicked that goal, bills were paid. That's a big one for me. I believe a lot of builders can identify with this if you've got, you know, draws coming in and certain components of those draws are already paid, you know, or, you know, they, they might be due or in, usually you are just sort of hanging in, well, I have been hanging in there for the draw, you know. Yeah. Um, now, bills paid and, you know, I was, so that's helped us do lots of things, um, forecast our, you know, our expenditure or, you know, our, our, get our cash flow accurate so we could say look we're you know we've got this draw coming in this is the so back to the schedule this is our schedule this is when the money's going to fall this is when you know things are going to be due and to be ahead of the game for the first time it, over the across the board is what, what I'm saying here not you know obviously up and down but in my experience but this is across the board being on top of it financially and having confidence to know okay we've got that paid this is what we've got um, you know, coming in, we know we've got these expenses in the background and we've still got money in the bank. If I'm not mistaken, you know, all things considered, that's a pretty positive position to be in. And it's been consistent from, uh, it, it's almost like we just had to plug this in. I can't believe it. It's like, had I done this 20 years ago, I, I've actually made this comment to Dennis. Damn, I wish this was compulsory. I know, I know that may sound ridiculous, but I really believe that the benefit I've received from it and I like I said 20 plus years of doing this you know the old thing you know yeah old head young Charles is that the saying you know um I, I I think you know knowing what I know now that I would not have stepped forward in business without this kind of mentoring well it's and interesting I really think it's necessary it's interesting because I was actually going to ask you that question had you known now what you know would yeah. you have changed or avoided things but you've answered that question for me so absolutely <laughs> so look of all the APB systems and everything that you've taken into action you know what is the one thing that was a game changer that set the tone for the rest of the the year for you, you know, through the through the programming and everything else? Because you talked a little bit about the fact that Dennis picked something up in the accounting and that kind of was an observation and you were like, okay, that's a start. But what was the game changer moment for you where you were like, you were onto something? Yeah, it's when those figures came back in. Like Dennis helped us, like they don't just sort of set a goal, help you set a goal, because it's it's we that set the goal, not APB. You know, we set the goal. We wanted it to be uh, reachable, but just slightly up there. So when we're getting the figures back in and the reviews with Dennis um, and we're looking at it and, and like, we were getting there before he was even reviewing it. We're looking at it going, this can't be. And I'm in a position of disbelief. You know, I'm like, no, it can't be that. I, I don't think easy is the right word, but that's simple. It mm. can't be that simple. And, look, my experience has been, you know, we were just missing that. Just a clear understanding, I think. A couple of little things were not 
we didn't know or we were doing incorrectly. But certainly it's all around the financial management, you know, for me. That's a clear, you know, you can set whatever goals you want. You can talk about all sorts of things, but if the money's not right, right. or your understanding of running a business financially isn't clear and understood, even though I've been doing it so long, the old saying, you know, flying by the seat of your pants, you can only do that so long from my experience before you get into trouble. Obviously, I've learned enough to work just outside of that. But we was there was so much. We, the motor was just you know we were running on. It's an eight cylinder motor. We we're running on four. You know, like yeah. He just he just helped us. I don't know if synergies are right. We're like just connect connects probably these understandings that I had, and the bits that were missing, the misunderstandings or the lack of knowledge. And it's again, it's all around that financial management and planning, understanding. Um, yeah, you know, I thought Whippers, uh, sorry, your work in progress. I thought that was done annually. My accountant would usually ask me, you know, can what you know, as at thirtieth of June, you know, what's your work in progress? I'd have a look at invoicing in July. Um, have a look at you know work we had on at the time and expenditure, and I'd come up with this figure and just say, well, that's our work in progress. That is so far, that's so you know, <laughs> not right. And to know that that can be done consistently throughout the financial year and should be done consistently throughout the financial year is again a game changer because it's it's helping you get accurate figures of where you are actually at and not just from you know a cash flow forecast in terms of you know creating this balloon picture but targeting things like well okay we're going to have tax coming in you know and having a clear understanding of what work in progress you've got at certain times just giving you a clearer picture so that you, yeah, again, that's the significant thing for us is just a clearer understanding of our financial systems and changing those, but also, you know, cash flow forecasting. We're only really just getting into that. But like I said, I've, I've obviously got some understanding of these things. So with this new knowledge or this connection that I talk about that Dennis yeah. has really helped us with, it's just making the whole motor start to function and we're not coughing and spluttering as much that's for sure (laughs) well speaking of you know future planning are you are you in the process right now adopting new softwares potentially focusing on new leads or is that something that's on the horizon for you and what are you looking forward to right now you know taking taking this forward we put the cart before the horse there a little bit in that we had the soft the um software in place so we've been using I presume it's okay for me to mention the yeah, software. Yeah, absolutely. We, for our estimating, we use Solo Assist for our quoting and estimating, and that's a program that's been put together by both a friend of mine and someone that I've worked with in the industry, so it's a builder, and it's very fluid. So that, you know, in terms of getting you know, from a quoting point of view, I'm about to put a big one in here that Dennis helped us with, in terms of using that software, I won't say I was all over it because I constantly talk to the uh, principal of that business and he says, mate, you're running on about 17%. Dive into this software and use it, you know, So, which we're starting to do, you know, and use what's available to us. And also we use um, Builder Trend for our daily management, if you like, our project management, our scheduling. So we had that stuff in place. You can appreciate my frustration, right? Okay, we've got this really awesome software. Um, you know, we've been in business for some time. Something's missing. Why don't I just have this, you know, and when other people tell you about their business, you know, it's always exciting or sometimes it's, you know, always difficult. But when you get those exciting stories, you know, the grass is always greener and you're not getting the full picture necessarily. But, you, you know, you do scratch your head and go, man, you know, how... <laughs> How can they be there and I'm here, you know? So just seeing that all come together, APB, that information and that knowledge has help, helped us tie that together. But one thing we identified early in that financial assessment, we were looking at our our margins. So we're, again, in a custom field, if you like, custom build builds, architectural and I'm thinking, you know, I'm running a particular margin and that's, you know, that, that's where it's at. We were way off where we needed to be. We needed to increase our margins because when we looked at, you know, our fixed costs and 
we were looking at where jobs were coming in financially, you know, money in, money out, we were able to identify fairly quickly that our margin wasn't where it needed to be. We do intend to push that up a little bit. Again, we've got that reputation. We're in that field. We don't want to ever overcharge our clients, but you need to be making money. And we identified early that there was an issue there. So we've pushed it up a bit, sort of a stage one of, of two. You know, you can't just, I, I don't believe you can just jump to this magical figure. We wouldn't have any work. But we, we certainly pushed it up. We've checked that in the industry with our, like if you like our, we get a constant stream of work from a particular architect. We're constantly checking those figures with them. And we're consistent. And here's the thing, we are still just below one of our biggest competitors. So we've got room to grow there and hit these targets. So that's a big one. You know, a lot of builders, like we're all sensitive when it comes to margins. We we want it to be right. We don't want to be doing this for free. We need to be making money. We're in business. But you, you feel like you've got this pressure that you you cannot be above this figure, um, you know, whatever that is for, for each individual and the area they're in. But the truth of the matter is with help, with understanding your your marketing, so your brand strategy, your marketing, all of that sort of guts of the um, business, if you're able to get more leads in, you're able to pick and choose. Firstly, identify the client that's right for you and the job that's right for you. So you're able to pick and choose a little bit, well, a lot more because not this is a thing that got me. I, I said to Dennis, you know, when I talk to someone, I win over 90% of my jobs thinking that that was a good thing, uh, Dennis's response <laughs> was, was not, not less than encouraging, but pretty much, well, that's not a good thing because it can't be that everyone's right for us. So just little things like that, if you can appreciate, they've only, some have been major things, but just little things and going, you know what, I've been patting myself on the back going, you know, I'm winning all this work, uh, but shooting us in the foot because that job was probably not profitable from the outset or, you know, potentially profitable from the outset. And I've just gone, yeah, well, look at me. I've won this yeah, to myself, uh, pat myself on the back. You know, I'm really good at this. Well, no, I'm not. So there's been a lot of eye-openers where, you know, particularly I, I just couldn't understand. I, I said, oh, look, look, Dennis, marketing, I've got this in the bag, you know. like <laughs> I, I probably don't need help with that. And he encouraged me very uh, softly, I guess, uh, to look at it differently. The boy, was I wrong. I so don't have a, a clear understanding i mean just being able to delineate between a line between marketing and advertising brand brand strategy and behind that having a good look at your you know what your values are they've also helped us put that together and the good thing is i was able to pass that over to my son there's no good me handing a business over to him and saying mate yeah this is what we are about i passed the buck in that sense to him and said what are we about what are our values? What are the key things? You know, and we come up with some things. We've changed it since. Um, so it's been an evolution. But, you know, excellence, challenging ourselves uh, to do better, to learn. All of us, myself absolutely included first and foremost in that, learning. So under that learning, you know, mentoring. I have a mentoring role. I'd said before we're committed to apprentices um, and learning personally and encouraging that for everyone because, you know, you can you can be in a job and enjoy it, but not love it. You know, but if you're learning and you're moving forward, you know, you're going to stick around. You're going to want to be a part of this. You know, mm -hmm. so and and we've got a commitment. You know, this, this is something that Aiden worked on that was encouraged. What are the best outcomes for our clients? We want that for our clients. You know, and we want quality is one of those words. You know, it's a dirty word in the building industry, but I actually believe it's time to bring it back really understand what that means. People want things to be done really well and to know that when they've got their back turned, you're going to make sure that's right. You know, it might be hidden behind a frame. Hidden's the word that's got to be eradicated. You know, it's got to be right. And also a commitment to clear communication and these relationships, you know. Relationships are key one for us, right in that whole family business thing. If we're not about relationship, what are we doing this for? And before, like I said, not a lot of money. <laughs> so, and, you know, just this openness, this transparency and this frankness, you know, they're, they're, we've a lot, like we're saying they're our values. They're things that we want to move forward. We're getting an understanding of what we look like, what our avatar is, you know, 
Um, yeah. We're getting obviously getting a bit of help around this stuff. This isn't <laughs> apparently this is common language. <laughs> well, well, so there's a sense of excitement that I can sense yeah. from from Absolutely. you know how passionate you're talking about you know the mentoring program. There's a sense yeah. of rejuvenation from you know yeah. just how you're expressing everything. For someone, you know, for our listeners out there that aren't fortunate to have a mentor yet or are considering to jump into a mentoring program as well, what what advice do you have for them? Because it sounds like you've gone through an entire mindset change, mindset change and shift and, and your values have really been articulated to have that curiosity for mentoring. What advice do you have someone that is considering becoming a member or also looking to work with, with the, one of the coaches as well? The advice would be, to different people at different stages. If you're young and in the trade, depending on what level of mentoring you choose, could be viewed as an expensive process. I actually believe that that's the wrong way of looking at it. It costs money. You know, there are people working in the behind, you know, you've got a team of people working for you in the background here, you know. Someone's got to pay for that. But it, I'm... I'm careful to use this word but I will use it I think it's essential for young players that are getting into the trade it is changing so rapidly see I've had a failure a business failure historically and that taught me that I have first of all a responsibility I thought I understood that now I have a clear understanding I have a responsibility that to my clients, I have an, an oh, I absolutely have a responsibility to the people that work with me and for me in that sense. And I understand what that means now. You've got to lower the risk. We've got to mitigate. We've got to manage the risk. How can you do that when you're a new player? You're fresh. Look, we all thought back in the day you, you're a good chippy. That's all you had to be. I was, as I mentioned before, I was very fortunate to get this. Highly skilled training, you know, very fortunate, um, blessed, whatever words you want to use, I'm open to it all. But look at it, you know, that's what I said, identify how you got to here. But the secret behind all of that is um, you've got to understand that you've got to be um, transformable. You've got to be teachable from the outset. If you've got that attitude, you really can achieve anything. It's taken me 20 years, you know, I don't say this so easily, you know, from the outset, knowing what I know now, um, this is why Aiden, my son, and my daughter, Jordan, who, as I mentioned before, Jordan's doing the, the book work and being trained in accounting. Aiden is um, being trained in managing the projects now, so project management, that's ongoing, um, but he is running projects with me. These guys are involved in that that coaching. So in a sense... It's not financially coming out of their pocket, but it is in terms of their part of the business. So the I would not proceed forward for their sake. They're these young players. I would make sure. So if I'm a young player looking at getting into the building industry, find a way to afford this. You can afford the new drop saw. You can afford the new, you know, we find a way. We always do. We work hard. But I'm saying as a tool in your kit, like it's like re, having a re take a relook at safety. Safety is one of the tools in your toolkit. You can't operate without this tool now. Yep. You know, we used to wing it. We can't wing it. It's got to be managed. <laughs> I'm saying that this mentoring is an essential tool in your toolkit, particularly if you're a young player. Yeah. If you've been if you've been operating for a while, or like in my case, years, and it's it's just not connecting. It's just you know. It should be easier than this. No, it shouldn't. But it should be simpler than this. And it should work, you know. Well, that just means something's, you know, you've got a, either a misunderstanding or, you know, it, it's just not connecting. I, I use that word. And you just might need someone else to have a, an objective perspective outside of you because we get quite emotionally involved. This is our baby, you know, this business. But the frustration, I can't tell you, like, you know, I, I've always said to myself, the day I can actually say that I've turned a decent profit, I think I'll go sit down in the paddock with a you know six pack of Bud Lights. I'll do for your um, <laughs> your benefit um, and have a good old cry because you're emotionally attached, and we don't want that much. We just want to make sure that people are looked after, the people that work with us and that employ us, 
Um, they're getting good value, but you want to you want to turn a profit. You know, it, it just makes the whole thing work. And the joy that comes out of that, I can't tell you. So, if you've been in the game and you're looking at um, mentoring as an option, for myself, it has made all the difference. Yeah. But, but it's not. It's holistic. It's not just like oh, we've got all the answers. They have encouraged us to look at other things. We are looking at this software that we're using and using it further and having it part of this big picture. We're getting help with marketing. APB have a lot of knowledge and, and stuff there, but we're, we've got another company that's helping us there with our, you know, our, our brand strategy, if you like, and I'm really thankful for that. So it's a holistic approach to running a building business and understanding that there are a lot of tools available, but you have to have that basic knowledge. Yeah. Um, you have to break it down, simplify it, and then just sort of from the building blocks, build it back up again. I think every chippy can understand that. You talk about building a legacy with a family business, you know, and that's mm. something that you want to leave, you know, your kids with this gift that has, you know, the legroom to grow even further. What goes into creating that legacy? And at what point in your career did you decide to go down this path to create something for your kids? Yeah, well, you know, when kids, your kids, we've, Jules and I have got four kids. And when they go out into the world and they are setting their own careers, um, that's not an easy space. It's not an easy place. Nowadays, if you're building a business, you know, the kids, because kids tend to move on from their hometown or sometimes they stay like my son Aiden has. Well, when I say hometown, we're originally from Queensland, so our older kids have moved back there. But Jordan's still an integral, you know, part of our business. Like we can't, we, we won't do business without her. She, like I said, she's she's dealing with the bookwork. She's dealing with and learning the accounting with an accountant overseeing, and but taking on so much more. She's really excited about the opportunity that she has. So, in other words, she's able to look at this business and say, "Hang on, this is as good as I want it to be." Right. She's really getting that understanding, at, which is exactly what I've wanted. I don't want it to be okay, guys, today we're going to do this. That's all me, you know. I want them to realise the potential and the opportunity that's before them. Excuse me, from a career point of view, an ongoing, a life point of view, but also on a day-to-day basis, these kids can set their own, uh, like their own goals. And nothing's more exciting than that for me now because in training that's exactly what we want. We want to empower people to be able to do their do their thing and to realize that that's you now that looks like what they ever want it to look like so that's exciting for me you know before the mentoring I would say I was exhausted I've now actually earned back all this time so I was running entirely inefficiently really that's the truth of it but what I was doing before let me say I can do in a very short period of time now but also having time to work on the business that's giving me time to think about these things. Okay, well, you know, um, what what are, what is it we're handing over here? You know, for for the kids, you know, is it is it a business that's struggling, that's um, got the legacy of dad not getting it together? That that'll only hold them back. I want them to realise that first of all, you've got to be teachable, you've got to be transformable, you've got to be able to move forward. And once they identify that in themselves, because let's face the facts, it's only an idea. Uh, you know, running a business, you know, you come up with this idea, you know, this is what you think it looks like. Well, once they get that picture in their head and what that looks like for them, the motor's already running. And if they, if you've given them this guidance, they've had this mentoring and this direction, the rest is history, I reckon. So, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, and and you know the advice I guess for the listeners out there who are who have potentially family members out there, it's to create a teachable mindset and and allow Absolutely. allow everyone from the top up. Because you talked about the fact that you had to change your values and Absolutely. incorporate mentoring as part of this as well, right? Yeah. Um, Let's talk about, you know, in your area uh, and, and where you specialize in, you know, do you know the other builders? Builders can, can sometimes live a very isolating world. So <laughs> how's your relationship with other builders? How do you stack up and compare with the with the other builders? And what, what do other builders say about your company today, you know? Yeah, well, I, I do. I, I do have feelers out there. I've been doing that this long enough. You know, you've got to know where you stand with your competitors. 
I, I don't think you should worry about your competitors, but you should definitely know, first of all, be able to identify who they are. So, but you're right in saying that the builders, it's almost a, you know, a commandment, builders, <laughs> thou shalt not talk to each other. It's a weird thing. Uh, I had a guy uh, um, finished a job one afternoon and down at the pub, which I don't do often, but let's just go with it. And all the boys are down there and he comes up to us and there's this young fella in our crew that's going out to do his own thing. Then this guy staggers out of the, <laughs> out of the pub uh, full as and, uh, full as a butcher's pup, and he, he he sort of staggers over there and he goes, what are you doing, young fella? He goes, oh, I'm moving on. He goes, and, uh, what are you, oh, I'm going to do my own thing. And he goes, all you builders are the same. He said, you are all stupid. He says, if you've just learnt to work together and to communicate together, the world would be a different place. He said, you're all reinventing the wheel. You live in a vacuum and then staggered off into his car. We wet ourselves because... <laughs> We don't know this bloke, but gee, he was dead right. Like it, it, it is a, it's a funny world, you know. But I think that's changing, particularly with you know the access to yeah. podcast, social media, all that. Now you're able to at least learn and listen um, from others. But yeah, I, I do know that in, in our world, I guess we've got some really good competitors. I've been doing this, as I keep saying, for a while. I'm, I'm not going to pull the old for 45 years, you know, because uh, that doesn't work. Um, but long enough to know. And I've been scratching my head. How can this, you know, there's a young player. He's been in the game 10 years and he's leagues ahead of me in terms of the jobs, the leads he's getting, this profit, you know, uh, figure that he clearly puts in his job. You know, he's up there. He's slight, Like I said, he's slightly above us. But um, he's he's all over it. And it's, again, he's one of these young fellas. I know he received mentoring from Day Dot. And he's, he's also gone on, I believe, to do, you know, a business degree. Like he's always learning, moving forward. And he has a very clear understanding of marketing and strategy there. And he he's, he's overtaken the industry down here. And I'm scratching my head. How can he do that? He doesn't have my experience. Realising that that's not everything. You've got to have a clearer understanding of how people operate. When someone's looking for a job, how does my um, you know, website, for example, answer some of their questions? But, but also, as importantly, how does it deal with some of their fears? You know, like they don't want, you know, they're, they're about to spend X, Y, Z, you know, with, like I said, we're, we're, we're high end. Big money, uh, they, they want to know they've got the right team, you know, and he's able to communicate that really well. Yeah. He's had mentoring. He's got it together. He knows what he's doing. And he has overtaken me. You know, I've got over 20 years. He's, uh, I think, 10 years, if, if that, in his own business. And he's, he's, he's slicing off parts of the market, you know. He's yeah. just, I'll have that, and he's got it. Um, yeah. So I learned that, uh, that we've got to be, you know, We've got to, I've got to learn something from that. Yeah. And I do know that our reputation out there, it's good. Like we're, we're a solid player. People know that we're going to get the details right. That's, that's a big thing for me. But also the feedback I'm getting, so not just from that dirty word that I say quality point of view, but also in how we operate with our staff. Because I said it can't be about relationships and you're a mongrel to work with. I have been that that person where I'm just so frustrated and upset that you project that onto other people and that's that's a horrible place to be right it's it's, it's everything against you know our values that I right. but I've been there I've been that person don't you worry and again you have a responsibility to get this right get your crap together you know right can I say well, that <laughs> no yeah you can yeah, of course and, and you know it's really inspiring because most people get threatened by competitors the fact that you look at your competitors and find learning opportunities is pretty yeah. humbling and inspiring I uh, feel I could talk to you for ages but I'm going to I'm going to wrap this up with a really important question and I was going to I was going to reverse it and say if you had a time machine and went back in time what would you do differently but you've answered that <laughs> um but I I'm, I'm curious you know you you said something that really stuck out to me which is you you you've got some time back now you know mm. you're spending time on on the business you've got you know the yeah. legacy uh, planning as well 
if you have a time machine and projected where you're going, and, and it sounds like you're really excited about the journey ahead, what does future Phil uh, tell you about the future? And where do you see yourself in the coming years with the game plan that you're building right now with you know the kids taking on the responsibility as well? Where do you see yourself in the next few years? Well, there's a, there's a little bit of humour in this one. It has been said by my son many a time that once he takes over, I'm the first person he's going to sack. Uh, so at least now I'm employable. <laughs> Maybe you can be the advisor um, at that point. Maybe you can be I the advisor. Love, uh, look, you can't replace experience. I'll tell you what, you can paint it different colours, as I said, with one of my competitors, but you can't replace it. So I think the kids are always going to draw from that. My role will probably be oversight, like overseeing rather, in terms of, you know, when they're winning clients and communicate. I love that part. I love talking to people clearly. Uh, and I think I'm always going to have a role. But my um, role as it is now, you know, in the next five years, certainly 10 at most, but we're thinking five years, I'm going to ease out of you know, wearing nine hats. I'd like to just wear one or two and the kids are going to, they're going to be running this this ship. And, and having the confidence to know that they're going to get it, they've got something to work with here, I'm not handing over a dirty motor. Um, you know, it's already, it's being worked. It's, you know, it's not, it's not fully refined. It's, it's being tuned. Um, but we, we're getting there. And that's given me a lot of confidence. I, I, it makes me smile thinking about the future. Um, but I do see that the kids are going to be out. I don't think, in my opinion, I don't think this is ever going to be a multinational, mate. You know, like we're we're going to stay in in a certain at a certain size, I guess. Always having the opportunity to expand, but um, at least they'll be making those decisions with confidence, knowledge, and like and the right kind of knowledge, and relying on like being able to identify. Okay, well, I don't do that, but this person can, and be in a position where they can employ that person. They've got the financial base to do so. And that's another thing I've learned. You know, you've got to have the right people uh, in the right right roles. And, and Dennis has helped us identify all the individual roles, you know, in the company. It's something I thought I had a grasp of as well, but I didn't. <laughs> I know, it's obvious. But, but, yeah, so looking to the future, yeah, the kids are going to take this thing over. And I think they're going to have a wonderful business and um, crew of people to work with because, who wouldn't want to work for a company that's moving forward, pays well, and your personal experience while you're working for it is a positive one for your family? You know, I don't. I hate hearing people say, "I hate my job." You know, I'm doing this. You know, I'm just turning the the wheels. That's a horrible thing. I know it's a reality, but it's a horrible thing. So I think the kids are going to have the opportunity to employ people. Um, that can benefit from that um, positive experience, that positive work experience for their own careers. You know, as I said, learning, excellent, that commitment. Yeah. yeah. Well, Phil, it's been a pleasure jamming with you. I look forward to keep up with your progress. We usually have guests back again. I'd love to hear about oh. your journey in the future as well. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and perhaps we'll have your son or your daughter, both of them in the future on the episodes. Uh, oh, but thank you so much for your time and just the humility about the coaching mindset is just, it's really refreshing. And I can sense the excitement and, and uh, I've had Dennis on the show as well. So it's great to hear some amazing stories about you and Dennis as well. Thanks, Bosco. That's great. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely, mate. Chat soon. Okay. See you. Thank you for listening. Remember to subscribe to Professional Builder Secrets on your favorite podcast platform and leave a review. To learn more about how the systems at the Association of Professional Builders can help you grow your building company, visit associationofprofessionalbuilders.com. See you next time.